Uh, thank you all for coming. Just a quick reminder, if you have not already turned off your cell phone, please do so. Um, I, uh, I want to very quickly um, introduce our panelists. If you have not um, uh, received or looked at the invitation, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about who these people are, but we've got Tom Jocelyn here from FDD. Uh, we've got uh, Bruce Hoffman, whose uh, resume is way longer than I could possibly get into, but uh, with extensive experience uh, in both U.S. government as well as in academia. And we also have David Gardenstein-Ross, who is an expert here at FDD as well. Uh, uh, on Al-Qaeda. Uh, the topic of discussion here today is understanding Al-Qaeda and its affiliates. Is it a global threat or a JV squad? Uh, the JV squad reference, of course, is to uh, a line by the President recently, and I will quote, if a JV team puts on Lakers uniforms, that doesn't make them Kobe Bryant. Uh, we are going to discuss that today, what that means, what that is a reference to, and uh, perhaps try to unpack the Al-Qaeda phenomenon uh, just a bit before getting into some other questions. We have asked our panelists not to prepare speeches. I'm going to ask them each several questions. We'll try to get through them as quickly as possible and then uh, get into a broader debate here uh, today. So the first thing that I'd like to ask each of our panelists today, if I could, is if we could do this in, in two minutes or less, just simply describe Al-Qaeda. What is Al-Qaeda? We'll start with Tom. Well, um, Al-Qaeda has always been a global international terrorist network. And when I say that um, as a terrorist network, they devote most of the resources actually from the beginning to waging insurgencies throughout the Middle East and elsewhere. And basically their principle, to define Al-Qaeda, you have to understand what they want. And what they want is to basically acquire power for their ideology and for themselves in uh, various territories. Um, I think the big popular misconception that we fight pretty regularly is that they are only interested in attacking us or mass casualty attacks on the U.S. or in the West. If you actually go back through the history of Al-Qaeda very carefully, you realize that is absolutely not true. That in fact, most of their assets from the beginning have been devoted to other things. And just to give one quick fact about this, the START database, uh, which is maintained by the Homeland Security or funded by the Homeland Security Department, actually says that prior to 9-11, uh, one, of, one of the quotes they use from various experts is that of the 16 recruits that went through Al-Qaeda training camps prior to 9-11, 15 of the 16 were devoted to insurgencies or waging wars, insurgency <coughs> warfare somewhere else. Only one out of the 16 was brought into their international terrorist operations. Um, I think that may even be an understatement, but I think that's a good way of describing the difference between how we see Al-Qaeda, which is a global global terror network and insurgency group versus what the prevailing, I think, discussion is here in the U.S. and elsewhere. Bruce? Okay. Uh, easy question to start with. Um, I would say Al-Qaeda is the same as it's always been, and that Al-Qaeda's existence today is a reflection of its DNA from when it was founded in 1988. It's both an idea and an organization. And of course the idea comes Al-Qaeda as the base or the foundation or the concept or the method from which this global jihadi revolution would be waged. Part of its strength and the reason that it's still around after a quarter of a century, which has outlived most other uh, terrorist groups, is that it's always operated both top down and bottom up mixed and matches, mixed and matched approaches uh, and operational styles. It's also and always has been both local and global. It's very adept at taking advantage of local opportunities, but it still has very much of a global agenda. I don't think anybody should be under any illusion about that. And then finally, and I, I've said this consistently from the start, although sometimes my, my uh, statements on this have been, uh, or analysis has been mag mangled. It's both conspiratorial and individual. So that is to say that it's always been both lone individuals or bunches of guys operating independently, but nonetheless inspired, animated, motivated by Al-Qaeda's propaganda, by their encouragement, by their processes of radicalization. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that Al-Qaeda has ever ceased to be an actual organizational entity with a very clear uh, command and control structure. Admittedly, that command and control structure has been more challenged, has been more damaged uh, over the past eight years or so, but I would argue it still exists. Uh, I think both of my fellow panelists do a, a very articulate job 
um, of stating what Al Qaeda is. Uh, I would agree with both of them and just add uh, one further thing, which is that in current debates about Al Qaeda, I, I see a tendency to define Al Qaeda by our own terms rather than defining it by how the organization would define itself. And you know, a good example of this is the JV quote that John began with. Um, the president's quote that if a JV team puts on uh, Lakers jerseys that doesn't make them Kobe Bryant has two meanings, one of which I think is right, one of which I disagree with. Uh, one meaning is that not all groups that call themselves Al-Qaeda pose an equal threat. I think that is correct. On the, sec uh, the, on the other hand, there's a second meaning which is that many of these groups are not actually Al-Qaeda. Uh, and it, this was made much more explicitly in a lot of the commentary that followed, where uh, many commentators argued that groups that aren't targeting the United States are not actually Al-Qaeda. Uh, for example, the New York Times editorial page very clearly said this after uh, David Kirkpatrick's <coughs> investigative piece about Benghazi, that only those groups that are targeting the US are actually Al-Qaeda. And as, as Tom pointed out in his statement, that's nonsense, right? The fact that a group is not targeting the US at a particular point doesn't mean they're not Al-Qaeda. Um, Al-Qaeda is both an idea and an organization, but as an organization, it's raison d'etre. Its key goal is not just to target the United States. Targeting the US is instrumental to other goals uh, and not the only thing that they care about. So I think it is very important uh, that in defining Al-Qaeda, we look uh, in reference to how they would define themselves and not just what we kind of think they should be. Bruce, you mentioned damage to the core. Could you just take a moment to explain what we say when we mean the core? And is that the same thing that, I mean, academically speaking, th there may be one conception of what the core is from within the intelligence community, there may be something else. Can you, can you try to unpack that for us? Well, I can give you my definition. Uh, inadequate or, uh, or complete as it might be. Um, the Al-Qaeda core is the Al-Qaeda senior leadership uh, based primarily <laughs> right now uh, in Pakistan um, that still exercises certainly ideological guidance over all of its component parts that um, controls the brand and recognizes uh, uh, requests to adopt or use the brand, uh, to affiliate um, with it. Um, it's taken to mean some of the, some of the hardcore members of Al-Qaeda, starting with uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri. Um, I would say, contrary to um, a, a State Department uh, uh, a statement a couple of weeks ago, I think the Al-Qaeda core still is more than one person. Ayman al-Zawahiri is not the last person there. It's a core that's diminished, but some of its key players and key operators are still around. And I think it still has, I think the most important definition of the core is that it still has the power to influence events elsewhere. And there's a big difference between influence and control. When I look at all the Al-Qaeda affiliates, the core did not create any of them. These organizations formed on their own and then for a variety of reasons chose to affiliate, associate, and formally align itself with the core. And I think that explains the relationship between the core and the affiliates. It's not the same top-down command, um, almost deregist capability that people assume. It's much looser, but I would go back to my original point that this has always been in Al-Qaeda's DNA to have this very loose type of structure. Tom, you look like you wanted to jump in. Yeah, no, I agree with uh, with most of what Bruce says. Uh, Bruce, I think, uh, has been dealing with this stuff for a long time and certainly gives a much more articulate and definition of this than, than unfortunately what I think a lot of uh, intelligence officials even do. I think part of the problem that we've had, and uh, I've been pressing on this, is you can't actually get uh, many U.S. officials to give you a formal definition of Al-Qaeda core. And even though this concept is the linchpin of our current counterterrorism strategy. And when they actually try and define it, what you find is that they give you several different competing definitions, none of which are actually <coughs> consistent with one another. Um, but in general, it is in fact the Al-Qaeda senior leadership. And I would warn against the idea that the senior leadership is only in Pakistan or Afghanistan. Pakistan It's quite clearly not. As I say to people all the time, the general manager of Al-Qaeda right now is where? He's in Yemen, right? You know, this is Nazar al wahashi the head of Al-Qaeda in Peninsula, the guy who was the protege and the aide de camp of Osama bin Laden, who was selected out of these Yemenis who came to serve bin Laden for his talents. He's currently the general manager of Al-Qaeda globally, and he's located in Yemen. So this, the, the 
core leadership, if this is if there even is such a thing, uh, senior leadership, is certainly not just in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, the second thing is that um, there's a lot, and I know David does a great job of explaining this, there's a lot we don't know or can't see about how the actual command and control or the actual infrastructure of all this works. However, there's a tendency, I would say, in the public discussion to dismiss the idea that there's any command and control or any organizational cohesion at all outright. Uh, and that's clearly wrong. I mean, I could point to numerous empirical examples just going back to 2011 through currently of where we can see senior leadership exercising its authority or doing one thing or another that shows that there is, as Bruce, I think, says, certainly a, a, a strong level of influence, uh, and in some cases it goes beyond that. So it, basically it is an international network where the core is not just confined to that one region and it is much more cohesive than I think a lot of people let on. You mentioned in there that this uh, notion of uh, of affiliates. Can can you just briefly explain what constitutes an affiliate? How one uh, goes about defining an affiliate within the Al Qaeda structure? Yeah. Well, actually, uh, um, John, I'll give you props because you're one of the early. Uh, innovators and analysts on this stuff. He, John had a book called Al-Qaeda's Armies years, years ago, which actually identified this as the strategy of Al-Qaeda was to build these regional branches. Um, and it would do that in a variety of ways. Some groups, I think they did outright build. Some of them didn't and were you know, joined up independently from the, the bottom up. Uh, and others, they influence sort of in that direction. But it's always been, if you go back to the 9-11 Commission report, you go back to a lot of the stuff that's been investigated by the U.S. government, you can see that the Al-Qaeda strategy always had these regional components to it. So the rise of the affiliates, which we almost act as if this is sort of happenstance or happened out of nowhere, is, is quite the opposite. Actually, this was part of a very deliberate paradigm. In fact, the 9-11 Commission described it as sort of, a, um, you know, expansion through mergers and alliances, something along those lines. I'm just loosely paraphrasing. So they've always been wanting to do that. And the affiliates, the thing about the affiliates is they are they are bound and sworn fealty to Al-Qaeda senior leadership. Um, there is a degree of command and control there, although we can, dis we can sort of uh, disagree over how much that is or debate how much it is, and we're sort of don't know really is the right answer. Um, but it is, you know, something that's very much part of Al Qaeda's original strategy. David, building on this question of, of affiliates, uh, we've seen a, a good bit of uh, affiliates in the news lately. A split uh, between Al Qaeda and one of its affiliates, ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Al Sham. Can you uh, explain how that fits into our understanding of affiliate groups, and has this sort of thing happened before? Uh, well, y you've certainly had uh, infighting before. Um, Algeria uh, and that civil war is a good example um, of where uh, you had um, significant splits in terms of uh, the approach to that conflict. Uh, but in, ter in terms of this specific event, um, the degree to which it has happened, uh, I would say, is not precedented. And it presents a very interesting situation. Um, as, as I think um, all of us have made clear, we don't see Al-Qaeda at this point uh, as being fragmented. And there's a significant debate amongst analysts as to whether it's fragmented or more unitary as an actor. Um, but I think this presents the possibility of either fragmentation um, or else uh, a, a strong cautionary tale to other affiliates. Uh, with respect to fragmentation, uh, the reason why ISIS was expelled from Al-Qaeda is because they were basically openly flouting uh, the Central Command's orders. Uh, there was infighting that was occurring within Syria, and um, Zawahiri had ordered ISIS to take part in mediation with other jihadist groups, including Jabhat al-Nusra. And you know, ISIS was uh, making a lot of noise about complying, but in fact, they weren't doing it. And so uh, the order that came down uh, on Sunday uh, expelling ISIS was uh, you know, a rather shocking one in the world of jihadism, which has sent immediate shockwaves uh, through that world. So if ISIS thrives despite the fact that uh, it was expelled from al-Qaeda, uh, this could, number one, make other organizations, other affiliates say, well, what is the cost to me if I disobey senior leadership? Uh, number two, they could attract some funding from traditional al-Qaeda donors. And number three, you can already see on jihadist message boards some kind of tensions that have been caused where some uh, members of these message boards and you know, some jihadists on Twitter and elsewhere are falling in with ISIS as opposed to uh, al-Qaeda. On the other hand, what you may end up happening is ISIS being the one who fragments rather than al-Qaeda. And you can already see some signs of this. Uh, for example, Abdullah al muhassini uh, a prominent Saudi cleric who's pro-jihadist, has called on ISIS fighters to defect. Uh, 
you have reports of some defections from, from ISIS. Uh, you may see serious fragmentation within it with splinter groups that consider themselves loyal to al-Qaeda's core as opposed to loyal to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who's the leader of ISIS. So th there are very interesting things that are going to emerge from this. And you know, we talked about mechanisms of command and control. I think actually this is a very fascinating test case where we'll actually start to see those mechanisms of control, those levers of control. But you can already see multiple clerics coming down and condemning ISIS. Uh, you might see some of their funding dry up. I don't think you'll see this immediately, but it actually really is a test case because at this point it has sent, as I said, an absolute shockwave through the world of jihadism and uh, one that is going to uh, change the dynamics in one direction or another. Tom, you want to just say this real quick. Um, I agree with everything Devi just said. I, uh, I just want to add this, that the, the, the main thing that you have to understand here, and this is actually really interesting because it goes to our understanding of how al-Qaeda operates, is that ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Sham, really was not waging war in Syria the way al-Qaeda's general command and senior leadership wanted them to, okay? And so then you have to ask the question, well, what is it that they want? And when you look at Jabhat al-Nusra, the other al-Qaeda branch, still the former al-Qaeda branch there, that tells you what they want. But there's also a detail that I reported in December, not to pimp my own reporting, but, uh, you know, that's very important understanding this. The top al-Qaeda representative in Syria, named Abu Khaled al-Suri, okay, a long-time al-Qaeda operative, is not in Jabhat al-Nusra. He was not in ISIS. He's in actually another group named Arar al-Sham, and he's a senior leader and founding member of that group. That tells you a level of sophistication in playing the insurgency that al-Qaeda has that's very different, I think, from the popular discussion, because the popular discussion focuses on these official branches, who's the official branch, who isn't. And here's a group that's not officially al-Qaeda, and yet Ayman al-Zawahiri's number one guy is a senior leader of that organization. That's, and that group is, is following what al-Qaeda's general command wants to do in Syria in terms of trying to build popular support and wage a more effective insurgency. Okay. Well, uh, you know, so we just heard about the breakaway uh, of one possible uh, faction or one faction from within al-Qaeda. But I think what we've also heard thus far is that the core is still rather sound. There is a rather robust array of affiliates that, uh, that seem to be operating not just in Syria but obviously worldwide. Bruce, can you talk for just a moment about the recent uh, narrative that we've been hearing that al-Qaeda is dead or that it's decimated or that it's on its heels or that it's reeling? What explains this if this is the state of Al-Qaeda right now? Well, there's nothing new in those, in, in those claims. In fact, I, had an, I published an article this past summer in Studies in Conflict and Terrorism titled Al-Qaeda's Uncertain Future, where I re recall similar declarations of Al-Qaeda's irrelevance, um, uh, death knell being sounded, and so on, going back uh, to 2003. Uh, I think this reflects an overall impatience over time with the war on terrorism. The fact that no one wants to be enmeshed in a war that really has no end date, that has no formal capitulation as in many of the conventional wars uh, we fought in the past. I think more recently it reflects a heartfelt desire on both sides of the aisle in the United States to turn inward on uh, domestic issues given our economy and not focus on what seems to be this uh, perennial threat and that in turn has given rise to uh, you know a stream of wishful thinking, really. In fact, I was, I was showing my fellow panelists one of my favorite articles, which I carry around with me, is from August 13th, 2006. It was the New York Times. So you can look it up yourselves later by Scott Shane. Terrorism experts say focus on Al Qaeda misses a broader threat. It describes, this is eight years ago, that Al Qaeda is a term today with deep connotations but elusive meaning, that it's over that one oversimplifies it to describe it as an organization, that it has become an inspiration, and then it quotes uh, uh, an anonymous U.S. intelligence official is, is saying, we're still wrapped up in thinking that this is a hierarchical organization. Well, the Abbottabad documents in particular, I think, dispelled uh, a lot of those notions. I had written another article right after Bin Laden's killing that was titled The Leader of the Leaderless Jihad, which showed very much contrary to the conventional wisdom and the assumptions prevailing at the time that Bin Laden was actually far more involved in Al-Qaeda, that Al-Qaeda hadn't become just uh, an ideology without any sort of leadership. So this is something that I think we've consistently gotten wrong. It's much more dangerous now for two reasons. Firstly, the sense of 
exhaustion today is much greater than it's ever been. And the exhaustion isn't just in our economy, but also in the intelligence community, and in, uh, really in our counterterrorism structure, where the threats, I would argue today, are becoming, are multiplying, becoming more diffuse and amorphous, more geographically varied. We no longer have one big threat in one place with one clear leader, but many threats in a variety of places. And that, I think, is testament to Al-Qaeda's power. Al-Qaeda is present today in more places than it was eight years ago. That's indis indisputable. It's not the core may not be as stronger, but the Al-Qaeda brand, I would argue, is just as strong, if not stronger. And this, I think, is part of their narrative, is that in the aftermath of the Arab Spring, they have been able to reassert and demonstrate their relevance. Um, just say one last thing. A lot of that is because they're very heavily pushing a sectarian argument that also has resonated in various parts of, um, of, of, of the Middle East. You know, be before, before we get to you, Tom, and I do want to ask you an important question, but just Dovetailing on, on one of Bruce's points, this failure to properly understand Al-Qaeda. David, you wrote a piece for Foreign Policy arguing that the predictions of analysts and pundits were terribly wrong in terms of the impact of both the Arab Spring on jihadism and on Al-Qaeda specifically. Uh, I mean, was this record worse than usual? Is there something specific about this argument right now that, that, that resonated with you? Uh, yeah, I, I think it was worse than usual in that, look, I remember the early debates um, about the Arab Spring and the effect that it would have. Um, I uh, was very skeptical of what I think can only be described as, you know, largely a consensus that these events were devastating to Al-Qaeda, uh, devastating to its narrative because you had nonviolent change in Tunisia and Egypt, and also devastating to it in, pre in presenting a democratic alternative to uh, the uh, dictatorial regimes that had dominated the region. I remember a lot of analysts pointing out how Al-Qaeda and jihadists were not a part of the revolutions, which isn't entirely true. I mean, they, they weren't in Egypt and Tunisia. They were in Libya, and they certainly were in Syria. Um, and I, I remember at the time being um, just kind of puzzled by how this analytic line had caught on so quickly and was so widespread. The other thing that, that puzzled me, and I, I write about this in the, the foreign policy piece because I think it's, it's important, uh, was that the analytic climate to me was much worse, much more personal uh, than usual. Um, something which, which um, I, I think is almost uh, indisputably the case. I mean, I, I know this both from uh, you know, organizations that, that um, used to regularly have me speak to them, which will not invite me back now, but, and uh, even prominent analysts who um, were extraordinarily personal in terms of um, rejecting any sort of skepticism about this view, which is not how a healthy uh, analytic field uh, operates. Uh, I see the current debate also being heated. Look, I think at the end of the day, what I argue in foreign policy, which I think is indisputably correct, is that here we're dealing with uh, an entity that operates clandestinely. There's a lot we can't see. And as a result, we have to be very modest as analysts and say, look, there's many possibilities. There's many ways it could be functioning. And to be open to the fact that other analysts are going to disagree, because a lot of what we're arguing about, at least when it comes to the organization of Al-Qaeda, is that which we cannot see. Um, and so when a very definitive view is not only pushed, and I can see that being pushed in terms of uh, the current state uh, of Al-Qaeda, uh, in terms of it no longer being an organization, when that's being pushed and the evidence isn't there, and uh, debate isn't occurring in kind of a, a rational, okay, we see differently and here's where our difference is our way, but instead a, a very heated way, that makes me suspicious as to what's going on. So turning to, to the question of, of you know, was it different than usual? Yes, it was different than usual because you know, back in, in 2006, for example, there's the Scott Shane article, but back then I remember you know, as part of these debates as well, there was uh, you know, more of a split. Um, many analysts, I think, oh, exaggerated uh, enormously the extent to which Al-Qaeda had become just an idea and no longer an exaggeration, but there certainly was another side of that debate. Uh, during the early Arab Spring, there were two sides, but one side was a few analysts, and one side was the vast majority of the field. And I think that, that you have to look back, like whenever a field gets something wrong, whatever it is, um, if, many, if most of the analysts uh, in an extraordinarily large way are on the wrong side of that debate, you have to ask why. And so I think that it's very worth returning to that. And, and to me, it comes down to certain epistolo epistemological problems, which I outlined in some detail in that foreign policy piece. 
Tom, let me just ask you to follow up on this. I remember reading about some of the uh, some of your work uh, with regard to this so-called Al Qaeda conference call that took place last year. This was the reporting that uh, I was by Eli Lake and Josh Rogan, if I'm not mistaken, where they talked about uh, they called it a conference call, but it was some sort of other uh, communications vehicle that allowed affiliate leaders to communicate with the core. There was a huge backlash to this. Can you talk about that for a moment? Yeah, it, it's amazing. I mean, uh, you know, Eli and Josh are very careful reporters. They're good reporters. They do a lot of, you know, diligent work. They're, they're, you know, they get a lot of scoops. And it was amazing to watch how people just automatically scoffed at the notion that there was any sort of, you know, international communication between Ayman al zawahiri and all these terrorist leaders. Um, now, conference call is a simplification of what actually occurred. If you get into the technical aspects of it, I'm not going to get into any of that because by my own sources and, and all that. But um, but it's quite clear that there was, and in fact, you can go through other press reports, like the NBC News, which identified a third participant on this communication, or you go to Bloomberg News, or you go to CNN, you can see the traces of this reporting that there was a very complicated, I will say, internet-based infrastructure that's used to communicate uh, between these different groups with, with Zawahiri. Um, What's interesting is that that actually was right. The essence of the reporting was right. The, the story was right. And yet there was this backlash to it as if it couldn't possibly be true, you know? Um, and in fact, it, it is true, you know? And so it's interesting to watch. But I'll say part of the reason why is because there's this dogmatic notion that the senior leadership has no say or influence or command or control or anything at all to do with all these other Al Qaeda affiliated groups around the world. And Quite frankly, David's totally right that there's a lot we can't see. This is a clandestine infrastructure, but there's a there's there's a good amount we can see too. Yeah. And the part that we the, the stuff that we do see um, actually totally contradicts that that paradigm. But I just want to add one thing. I know I see some journalists in the room here, right? And I've been pushing this. this is my ballywick now for since 2011. So I'm going to say this. If you don't remember anything else I ever say in my entire life, <laughs> please just pick up on this one note, okay? After Bin Laden was killed. Go back to what the senior Obama administration officials said about the extent of the archive kept it found in his lair. Okay, Tom Donilon was on, you know, senior official was on TV, meet the press the week after Bin Laden was killed, and said the contents of that library or the contents of his files would fill a small college library. That's that's his quote. Okay, to this day, 17 documents and a handful of videos have been released to the public. Okay, this is not transparency. I don't care if it was a Republican administration or a Democratic administration or what have you. This is not transparency. <laughs> and I think a lot of our debate about how Al Qaeda is structured, how it functions, how it's organized, I think the answers to a lot of those questions can be found in those documents. And I think there's no good reason for a lot of those documents to be kept from the public. I think we should see them. I think journalists should want to see them. And I'm going to tell you this the number I've had quoted to me, okay, from officials, okay, the number I've had quoted to me is over a million documents and files, okay? That's the number I've had quoted to me. That's certainly in the hundreds of thousands, okay? Now, are all those equally important? No, but a lot of them are, you know? And to date, 17 and a handful of videos have been released to the public. Let me just quickly uh, underscore what Tom said, it, just to say that I agree entirely. Um, I, I was testifying before Congress yesterday, and actually in my main testimony, one of my, the, the points I made at the end is that uh, we should hasten the declassification of these documents in order to better harness the talents of open source res researchers. Uh, a lot of these areas where, as I said, we can't actually see the organization, open source researchers would understand much, much more if they had access to, those, to, to these documents. And in, in my view, the vast majority of these, maybe 90% or more, could be released with no harm to U.S. national security, no harm uh, to U.S. national interests in any way. Um, and I think open, open source research is very important. It informs the public. It can inform policymakers. Uh, we should be getting the most out of this sphere. And as long as these documents remain classified, the vast, vast majority of them remain classified, uh, we're not going to be making the most of open source researchers. Bruce? Well, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's shameful that only 17 documents have been released um, out of literally thousands. And anybody who does serious historical research knows that you cannot make any kind of judgments on anything based on a handful of highly selected uh, documents. Why I also think it's absolutely imperative that they should be opened up is the conflicting things we've been told about them. 
uh, in yes. May mm -hmm. 2011, we were told that these documents incontrovertibly prove that Bin Laden was a mastermind, that he was far more involved in running Al-Qaeda operations than anyone assumed, that he was meeting financiers, that he had connections with affiliates and associates. And even the 17 documents that are released, I think, are highly ambiguous because you can find actually validation for all those points. But then, inexplicably, exactly a year later, in May 2012, we're told that it says completely the opposite, that Bin Laden was involved, exactly. that he was irrelevant, that Al-Qaeda really never existed as an organization. So which one is it? And you know, classification often depends on sources and methods. Well, we know the source of these documents. We know the method that they were gotten, the seals, right. seized them. I don't think there's any mystery. Now, admittedly, some of them, of course, are highly sensitive for various intelligence reasons, but it's hard to believe that we have not taken advantage of this opportunity to establish a baseline understanding of what Al-Qaeda was like in the last final days of Bin Laden's uh, reign, and in turn, how that would affect the current organization and direction of Al Qaeda. So this is, you know, completely lost, and it's 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 completely inexplicable as well. Tom, is there a, a specific explanation as to why they've not yet been released? I mean, obviously, there's th these would be incredibly important documents for the public to, to consume. I mean, I've been very loud in public about this, you know, testimony and articles and everything for you know a couple of years now. Um, I think there are a lot of bad reasons why they haven't been released. I can't think of any good ones. Uh, you know, the bottom line, from my perspective, is you know we know that the minimalist interpretation of what these documents say is wrong, okay? And here's how we know it's wrong. Because James Clapper, DNI, got in front of Congress and said that the immediate exploitation of these documents led to more than four, over 400 individual threats being tracked down by the U.S. intelligence community and its partners, okay? Now think about that. That's just the immediate threat stream that the U.S. intelligence community was able to cull out of these documents. And there were more than 400 of them, and I've been told that's actually more than 400 individual documents that you're talking about there in the threat stream. Now, that story, what Clapper said, is the precise opposite of the story that came out with the 17 documents that the administration released. The 17 documents the administration released came out not just as, as documents, but they came out with a narrative. And the narrative said that he was isolated or sidelined in Abbottabad. He was, uh, you know, this lion in winter. You know, he was all these things, right? None of that was true. You have Clapper saying to you that 400 media threats were, you know, culled out of these documents right away, right? So what I would say is that it's not just open source analysts. I think to is exactly right. He says it perfectly. It's the media journalists. These people should, if you want to actually question what the U.S. government is doing and understand what the U.S. government is doing and approach these things, whoever is in power, right, you should want transparency. You should want to see, you know, this incredible archive of information that's been captured. Real quick before we get to uh, to Q and A, uh, Bruce, if you could just talk for just a moment about Ayman um, Al Zawahri. Uh, you sort of get the sense that uh, he's living in Bin Laden's shadow. Uh, he's been kind of maligned as uh, maybe a less effective Al-Qaeda leader, uh, that the core under Zawahiri is not quite the same as perhaps it was under Bin Laden. Would you agree with that or, or would, you, uh, would you assess that differently? Well, and I, agree, I would agree with part of it in the last part. The core is no longer the same under al Zawahiri, but that's largely a reflection of uh, the drone campaign, of the attrition that the core has undertaken. But that's a different argument to saying that al Zawahiri is irre irrelevant, um, that he exercises no control over the movement. I think he's actually achieved almost the impossible. He's held the movement together now for three years at a time when it is splintering, but he's still even though the movement is splintering, even though there's more Al-Qaeda affiliates, at the same time, I go back to my earlier point, Al-Qaeda is in more places today than it was before Zawahiri was in control. The Al-Qaeda brand, I would argue, across North Africa and the Middle East and elsewhere is stronger today than it's ever been. And the Al-Qaeda ideology today has greater resonance than at any time in the years leading up to the Arab Spring. And that, I think, all comes down to the fact that al Zawahiri may not have the charisma or the communicative abilities that Bin Laden had, but at the same time, I think he's proven to be a not unreasonably effective leader. I mean, after all, he has the street uh, credentials. He's been a, a revolutionary terrorist since he's been 15 years old. Um, and he's, he's someone that I think, in our tendency, I th you know, I believe to herald al-Qaeda's defeat, we tend to write him off 
rather than look at just the accomplishments under a movement that's been under the intense stress. And I would argue, yes, the core is absolutely weaker than it's ever been, but it still functions. And in and of itself, that's a tremendous achievement. Tom, if memory serves, it was Zawahiri who came up with the idea of the affiliate structure, or at least was able to articulate it. And many people uh, called him the brains behind bin Laden's organization uh, back in the 1990s and perhaps the early part of the last decade. Would, would you agree with that assessment? And, and do you think we're seeing that right now? Well, I think he always worked hand in glove with bin Laden, and it's their joint vision that's given us what we've got. But I would say I do agree that he played a large role in the affiliate strategy. I mean, if you look at Al Qaeda and Islam Maghreb, this is a organization that came into formally merged with Al Qaeda, although Al Qaeda had a presence in its predecessors before that through Zawahiri. Zawahiri is actually the one that oversaw that. If you look at Nazar al Wahashi and Al Qaeda in the Rain Peninsula, it was actually Zawahiri who first recognized Wahashi as the head of Al Qaeda in Yemen, and he was the one who actually recognized. Wahashi Heishi's comments about the formation of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, you look at he spent time trying to manage the, the, the butcher of uh, Iraq, Abu Masab al Zarqawi, and the Al Qaeda in Iraq organization, which has always been problematic for them. Um, you know, he's, he, was, he had a heavy hand in that. We see today, um, and there's good reporting on his involvement with Jabhat al Nusra and overseeing its activities. And you can even see that in the, the Emir of Jabhat al Nusra, Abu Muhammad al Jalani, and what he says about Zawahiri's hand in things. So he's always been very active in seeing all this, and he played a direct role in actually the acquisition, growth, sponsorship of these affiliates and the strategy. And uh, this is, again, it undermines the idea that it's sort of there's some big distinction between the core and everything else. We're going to take, uh, I'm going to ask one more question here to David and then we'll go to, to, uh, to Q&A. David, uh, you've been a critic of, of the way that the, uh, the, the analyst community and perhaps to a certain extent the administration has approached uh, the question of Al-Qaeda. What needs to be done right now? I mean, just a prescription here. I mean, what needs to be done to get ourselves back on track here to better understand this phenomenon? I, I think uh, I would phrase it much more in terms of the analytic community uh, than the administration for this answer, because um, you're dealing with two different things, right? With, within the administration and larger IC, uh, there's much more access to information. They're not dealing, uh, they do deal with epistemological problems because you know, it is a clandestine organization. And even when you have access to a large amount of classified information, so that doesn't answer all your questions. But like looking at the analytic community, by which I'm talking about what happens in the public sphere, uh, you know, people who are talking to journalists and you know, writing and, and helping to uh, shape public views of this issue, uh, I think that, that the major thing, two, two things I would advocate are number one, just the need for much more analytic modesty and the need for, for much more of um, a, an upfront view of what we don't know. Like, I see a lot of assertions being made, and I sometimes call these out, and I do so less so now because I realize that it's not actually helping me and it's losing me friends. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, but I see assertions made all the time about the, the nature of Al-Qaeda and you know, the, uh, the idea that, that you know, the central organization is now irrelevant and you, know, you just have um, a, a, a bunch of organizations that are only loosely connected. And you know, maybe that's true. That's one way to look at it. But there is another view. Like, this panel presents another view. And I think it's important to understand the range of views that exist, number one. So I think, that, and um, I, I would add one other thing to that point, which is that um, uh, along with that, there's a need to think in terms of, of branches and contingencies. You know, what might what might happen? What might be going on? Um, so uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is I think that the analytic community needs to deal much more explicitly with what it doesn't know. Right? When you're making a factual claim about what Al Qaeda is, um, you know, uh, I think that 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 pointing out areas where we just don't know is very important. Like, look at what Tom was saying before, right? Uh, his view is that, um, uh, and I agree with this, is that, that Al-Qaeda's central leadership um, it has influence. That it inf and you know, a good example of this is the conference call, which we talked about. Uh, but there are questions, as he pointed out, about levers of control. How, it, how much control do they have? How can they actually um, shape what an affiliate does? I think that's a good way to point out, like number one, what his conception is, what he thinks going, is going on, and where the evidence doesn't actually answer the question. And to me, I try to hold analysts to that standard. How do you know what you're claiming? Because you know, the more uh, claims that are made without reference to evidence, the stronger those claims, the more I think one should question you know, whether this is the equivalent of fortune telling 
or whether it's actually being derived in some sort of scientific manner uh, in terms of what we know about the organization. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to now open this up to, uh, to the discussion with you. Uh, I'm going to just ask that you wait until the microphone arrives. Please uh, just state your name and affiliation and uh, do try to keep your questions in the form of a question and to keep them as short as possible so we can get to the many questions that it looks like we have. Uh, Dan, I saw your hand up first. Uh, Dan Pollock with the Zionist Organization of America. I appreciate all of your analysis. I kind of understand why the administration might want to deal with semantics about beating Al-Qaeda for political purpose, but why is everyone else hung up on whether or not a particular jihadist group who is actually targeting Americans and American interests is actually part of this larger, and for good reasons we need to know, I understand, why how they're connected so that we can fight them effectively. But it seems like we're getting hung up on semantics sometimes. And I wanted to know your reaction for the actual importance of that. Um, Anyone? Yeah, I think it, it actually uh, does make a difference. And I think that, that actually on both sides of the debate, uh, people feel that it makes a difference. Because you know, number one, if you have much more diffuse jihadism, uh, that means that, that strategy is actually going to be much more local and there'll be less coordination of strategy. Number two, if jihadism is, entire, is, is largely diffuse, then um, you know, the targeting of the central leadership might not make as much sense. Now, there's kind of a caveat to that, which is it might make sense in order to keep it diffuse and to stop the central leadership from reemerging. But uh, if, if, if it is very diffuse, then why are we spending so much time targeting Zawahiri if he's so powerless? Um, and uh, I think number three, uh, there's a question of uh, whether local groups, you know, in terms of why, why the Al-Qaeda brand matters, um, a, a good example uh, of, of this point is uh, Ansar al-Sharia in Tunisia, which like a few years ago was thought of as being a very local organization. As the Tunisian government has released more information about it, it seems more tied to al-Qaeda. They've alleged, for example, that uh, the leader of Ansar al-Sharia, um, Abu Iyad al-Tamizi, has taken uh, an oath of allegiance to the leader of al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, uh, to, to Drukdel. Uh, they've alleged that uh, Ansar al-Sharia in Tunisia uh, gets funding from the al-Qaeda network. Uh, now, if their allegations are correct, that means that situating it as just local um, isn't actually accurate, whereas if um, it is actually more unconnected to the network, then we can think of it as being largely a Tunisian, maybe somewhat an Algerian problem, uh, but not so much a problem that should be understood in terms of the regional, con uh, in terms of the regional context. So I think the, the question does make a difference, and I think actually on both sides, uh, there would be a consensus on that point. Bruce, you want to say anything? Well, I, I would just say that you know, your, your question, I think, goes to the heart of what the litmus test is now, of what you th how you think about al-Qaeda, whether you believe that it's a local problem or a global phenomena. And I think that there's a high degree of wishful thinking, of a profound desire to view it as a local phenomena, to say we defeated the big al-Qaeda, that's not a threat, the threat's not directed towards the United States. These are local problems that we can strengthen allies or um, host governments. However, if you see that, if you're inclined to see, or if there is in fact a connection between these local groups and the broader ideology, if there is this crossover in terms of funding, exchange of personnel, intelligence, and weapons, and so on, then you're talking about, in essence, what we've been fighting for well over a decade, which is a global conspiracy. And I think people want to redefine it as something, we beat the global uh, conspiracy, this is something different. Uh, at least my inclination is to say that this is the next phase in an ev evolutionary process and we need to accept it as such and to respond to it as such. It's not the same as the threat as it existed eight years ago, but that doesn't mean that Al-Qaeda central or the Al-Qaeda senior leadership is completely immaterial to it. Just real quick, John, really, oh, just, yeah. just real quick on the Ansar al-Sharia thing, I just want to chime in here real quick. This is a great example of where the misdefinitions of Al-Qaeda and mischaracterizations of what Al-Qaeda is about have really gotten in the way of understanding how these organizations work. The very first Ansar al-Sharia is indisputably created by Al-Qaeda in, Al in Yemen, okay, Al-Qaeda in the Yemen Peninsula, and answers to Nasr al-Wahashi. And it was the brand that they chose to be to 
be a catch-all for their governance efforts, for their implementation of Sharia. These are all local concerns, right? It shows you that Al-Qaeda has these local concerns as one of their primary drivers. And in fact, if you go back through the statements by Al-Qaeda senior leadership, they're very clear that defending Sharia in these lands and implementing Sharia law is their, their number one objective, number one, number two, depending on which statement you go through, okay? You go to Ansar al-Sharia in Egypt, right? Founded by Ayman al zawahiris henchman from the 1980s, okay? His brother, I've got all the videos, was a star at their events, right? It's all, all guys who surrounded Ayman al zawahiri were responsible for founding that organization. You go to Tunisia, as I, you know, as we just discussed, it's now the position of the State Department that in fact it's tied to Al-Qaeda's affiliates, not just one, right? But multiple affiliates, including Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb. So now the State Department has conceded and said that Ansar al-Sharia Tunisia is part of the Al-Qaeda network, or at least tied to it in all these affiliates, right? Why would we assume that Ansar al-Sharia in Libya, which I don't want to go off on a filibuster here, is any different? And in fact, I can walk you through the evidence saying it isn't, right? But the whole point is that Ansar al-Sharia, this, this adoption of a new brand, shows you that Al-Qaeda has a much different vision of the world and what it wants than I think the highly stylized narrative we have here in the U.S., right? They want something much different, which is local power. Back there. Thanks. Uh, Max Kelly, Booz Allen Hamilton, and uh, Center for Complex Operations at NDU. Um, you've already begun to answer my first question, which was uh, picking up on Bruce's point about the strength of Al-Qaeda and its distribution and, and growing distribution across the world. I is, the, is a critical element of Al-Qaeda's, Al-Qaeda Central's strength, its willingness to adapt to local conditions and co-opt those local, and, and this may be an obvious point, but it then goes to the question of strategy to counter it. In your opinion, and this is a question for the entire panel, does, should our strategies for fighting the affiliates be keyed primarily to addressing the local uh, conditions that al allow that Al-Qaeda has taken advantage of, or should we be focused primarily on rooting out whatever transnational elements of Al-Qaeda are there and that on only after doing that, going after the local conditions. Thank you. Bruce, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, it seems to me that, that in formulating our own strategy, there's two things we should do. Um, one is to look at, for the individual local affiliate, what's their center of gravity, and where are they weakest? Um, so, for example, it, uh, you know, the group I've, I've done the most work on and done field research on, um, uh, so specifically field research on in the past year is Ansar al Sharia Tunisia. And, and there, um, number one, unless Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb becomes a part of the fight, which I think actually uh, may well happen, but unless that happens, right now they're on their back foot. Uh, they're less resilient than other organizations. The Tunisian government is engaged in intensive sweeps against them. Um, so you know, the U.S.'s role can be much more in the background and can be uh, much more um, rooted in actually trying to completely uproot that network, which is what Tunisia right now is doing. They've banned them, uh, they're arresting them, uh, they're seizing weapons caches, and uh, I think that for that particular theater, um, that's working right uh, well for the moment. That could change. Uh, then when you look to Egypt, it's a very different situation, right? Groups that are, are um, tied to the AQ network there are in a stronger position. They're more resilient than AST. Um, and uh, there's also uh, significant ties to the transnational network. So your strategy there is going to be, be a bit different. It doesn't mean that the U.S. has to be at the forefront. Um, the, I think that, in fact, uh, almost certainly Egypt will be. Um, and uh, the final thing uh, with respect to this is that um, depending upon the local conditions, uh, certain U.S. strategies are going to be more and less effective. You know, one reason I think that, that, that I've said that the U.S.'s role should be supportive in Tunisia is because if we suddenly, like, look, for those who spent time in Tunisia understand that if the U.S. suddenly started flying drones there or if you had U.S. special operations raids, that would be extraordinarily disruptive to Tunisian society. It would actually drive a lot of people into their camp. Whereas in, in other countries, like, for example, Somalia, much more lawless, um, it's a place where you know, U.S. drone strikes, U.S. special operations raids will be uh, perceived in a much different light, especially in light of the fact that you already have the African Union mission in Somalia and you know, uh, Ethiopian forces who are now a part of it um, you know, patrolling there actively and carrying out very similar operations. So it should be very locally tailored based on those factors, in my view. Gentlemen, anything to add? Oh, 
Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for your expertise. Marjorie reminds Nabria from the American Conservative. My question is that given the statistic of 17 documents out of potentially hundreds of thousands, not a million, what do you think that says on the United States government's attitude on document classification and by extension their attitude on strategy and the role, war on terror? Tom? Well, look, I mean, I think it, it is a tough balance in terms of there's certain things that have to remain classified for operational purposes and that sort of thing, uh, absolutely. Um, but I think in this case, um, what was offensive to me and what Bruce uh, discussed was that you could see a change in the narrative on what these documents said, okay? And you can see it quite clear. I've documented it very carefully where you can see the first narrative that comes out says that bin Laden is heavily involved and, you know, is an active micromanager. And there's all this reporting from Sebastian Rotella, who's a great journalist, and these others who've done this amazing granular reporting on what their sources were saying about it. And then a year later, the narrative is flipped. Right? A year later, you can show the narrative becomes, nope, he's out of the game. He doesn't have any influence over what's going on at all. Right? That, to me, then says to me that uh, we need transparency. Because if we're going to have that sort of flip in the narrative, then the pub American public needs to see for themselves what the evidence is. Uh, because you have such uh, competing uh, uh, claims here. Now, I think it's obvious, and if you add up and you go through, troll through open sources daily uh, and go through all the different testimony of Congress and everything else, that the minimalist, the revised narrative that came out a year after the operation is completely false. That's obviously right. Now, what we should see, however, is the evidence of what the actual extent of this cohesion of the network and Bin Laden's involvement is. And it, it says to me that on something like that, which has to do with this organization that struck us on 9-11, you know, and that really has, has tied up American resources for more than a decade since, I think the American people should be able to have a better gauge of what it is exactly we've been fighting. And I think that's something that we should, in any cost-benefit analysis for moving forward, that should actually uh, inform that uh, analysis. Bruce? Well, I agree with, uh, with, with Tom. I think it's actually worse than that because if I was pulling my punches a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> if those 17 a documents. A very atypical for me. <laughs> incontrovertibly or unequivocally um, backed up or proved the revised narrative, that would be one thing. I mean, as I've written about both in the Wall Street Journal in May 2012 and in this article, Al-Qaeda's Uncertain Future last summer, those documents are highly ambiguous. That's why we need more material, because they suggest, I, th I think they're very susceptible to a completely different interpretation Agreed. than we've yeah. been, been offered. Uh, I think one of the bad things, too, is that uh, the West Point Center that was given them was just given those 17 documents and they themselves were deprived of the broader context including the classified material. So they only worked off of those 17 documents right. which means as fine a report or analysis as they did based on this thimble full of documents it's just uh, inherently incomplete. What it says about our attitudes, um, well the main thing is that history doesn't matter that there's no uh, organizational dimension. There's no uh, longevity to Al-Qaeda. That we're, Then we're going to be cast in a position of seeing every new manifestation of Al-Qaeda as something that's you know, completely unique, that never existed before. And we're going to deprive ourselves of understanding the chain of events, the chain of command, the evolution that the movement itself has undergone. And if we're blind to how this movement is, in my, art, in my analysis, constantly adapting and adjusting to even the most consequential countermeasures that have been directed against it, how are we ever going to defeat it? Um, to me, that this historical blindness really has deprived us of an opportunity to understand, to understand in, I think, immense detail, which is what these documents offer, exactly how Al-Qaeda operates, well, operated, and what light that might shed on how it operates today. I don't think that, uh, that Zawahiri took over an organization and completely reinvented it, has completely new systems in, in, in place, has completely different new communications uh, systems. So I think there's a lot to be learned. Just one quick, real quick point. What's interesting is, uh, if you think of the leaks of all the NSA's files, everything that came out from Snowden and all that stuff, you could see the, ha the havoc that's wreaked on America's presence in the world, our dealings with allies, all that sort of stuff. Isn't there actually an argument to be made that if you release some of Al-Qaeda's dirty laundry in these documents that you can wreak havoc on them, maybe by exposing some of their dirty secrets and how the nasty things they've done? You know, can't we learn from recent history to know that maybe this is a way to actually add to or actually cause some fragmentation, is if we actually air the disagreements between various commanders and the senior leadership? Uh, you know, so there, I think there are actually compelling national security reasons to release some of their secrets in the those lines. Also, I, I just have to jump back in. You know, what's the logic behind this? I mean, 
During the Iraq War, lots of documents were released by yeah. the U.S. government pertaining to Al-Qaeda. The Sinjar records, which were brilliant um, yep. dissection of how Al-Qaeda was operating um, in Iraq. So we have more recent documents in some instances of a live war that have been released, but then we're told that this body of knowledge that really is the corpus of Al-Qaeda's secret history, for some reason that may be years old, can't be released. That's right. Sean. <clears throat> yes, Sean Waterman, reporter. Um, a couple of questions. Um, firstly, on, on the documents, um, why the difference? Why the, uh, I mean, was there, was, uh, what, with the Shinjar, with the Harmony database which was produced, I mean, was there someone in the government who, who do you guys know that, that sort of advocated for, for that kind of public facing effort at that time? And um, <clears throat> uh, secondly, I wonder if you could, uh, the panel could comment. You know, my understanding was that the sort of the novelty of Al Qaeda originally was the focus on the far enemy, um, and that that was what sort of differentiated them from a lot of these other extremist organisations that were that were active. You know, uh, in the set in the late eighties, early nineties. Um, is that is that correct? And and ha has that changed? And and. Uh, you know, where are we now with regard to the affiliates? You know, in the past we were told AQAP was the most dangerous to the United States, the most focused on the far enemy. Has that changed? Uh, you know, wh wh where are we now with that with that divide? And is it still an important sort of marker? Uh, you know, in terms of of the ideological uh, the ideological uh, uh, imperatives that are guiding these organizations? Uh, I'll deal with the second of those. Um, in terms of what differentiated, differentiated Al-Qaeda, there were a few things. I mean, their, their focus on uh, the far enemy uh, was one, but uh, another differentiation is sheer organizational differentiation. Right? They were truly transnational coming out of the Afghan-Soviet war with their desire to uh, continue that jihad. Uh, they had a tremendous network of financial backers. This is uh, well-documented open source, the, the golden chain of donors. Uh, and there were charity complexes that supported them. Uh, the U.S. terrorist designations that happened shortly after 9-11 uh, really document uh, those supporters. Um, as to has that changed, I think part of it actually has changed, um, in particular since the Arab Spring. You know, the focus on the far enemy um, as, as I alluded to before, wasn't just because they want to attack the United States and that's what they're all about. It's because their view, uh, the view of their strategists was, was, I think, twofold. Number one was that the far enemy propped up the near enemy, uh, propped up the regimes they refer to as apostate regimes, propped up Israel, uh, not only with financial support, but also if those governments got into trouble, they thought the U.S. would step in. Uh, or Western countries, other Western countries, and prevent the revolution from succeeding. Uh, that, for example, is their analysis of what happened in Algeria with France's support for the Algerian regime. Uh, a second aspect of that is outlined by a jihadist think tank uh, after 9-11, uh, was that you know, if you attacked, for example, uh, Saudi Arabia, you would bring down not only the might of the Saudi regime, but you'd also bring down clerical condemnation. So there's this strategic aspect to attacking the far enemy, which is that if you attack the U.S. in Saudi Arabia, then Saudi Arabia has to support the United States. And the clerics also support the Saudi Arabia in fighting the U.S.'s war. And in their view, that then delegitimizes the Saudi regime and delegitimizes the clerics. Now, what has changed? What's changed is that you actually saw regimes in the region fall. Um, and regimes in the region uh, get significantly threatened. Um, you saw that, that in Egypt, obviously, in Tunisia, in Libya, and uh, in Syria, you see uh, a situation that's very much in flux. Assad has been regaining power, but you can see how powerful uh, those anti-government forces are. Uh, I did very extensive reading, uh, uh, published in uh, Studies in Conflict and Terrorism, which, which Bruce edits, uh, of um, jihadist statements in the first year after the Arab uprisings. And, uh, those statements very much document that they think that the revolutions really demonstrate the limits of U.S. power, which makes this focus on exclusive focus on the far enemy make much less sense. They have much more local and regional opportunity now. So I think that you're seeing a shift. Not that attacking the far enemy isn't important within the network, but it's not the exclusive thing 
that defines them because they have much more regional opportunity. Uh, as to the affiliates, um, I, I think that it is still true that Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula remains the one that is most focused on the U.S. and that is most dangerous to U.S. interests. I'll put just a, a little different spin, although I, I, I tend to agree with David. Um, you know, the far enemy and near enemy debate is, is, is the old version of the local or global threat today. If you believe that the threat now has devolved into purely parochial local threats, well, then it's near enemy. We can console ourselves. The U.S. or the West isn't lo any longer in the process of the terrorist groups, and it's over. However, my view of Al-Qaeda has always been, and I said this at the beginning, uh, you know, Jonathan said, you know, two-minute definition, it's top-down and bottom-up. It yeah. is as opportunistic as it is instrumental, and throughout its history, it's shifted between focusing on the local and the far enemy, or the near and the far enemy, depending as circumstances have dictated and opportunities have presented themselves. And I think this is one of the core reasons why Al-Qaeda has lasted as long as it has. It has this enormously adroit capability to shift between the two threats. Is the far enemy threat over? Well, I would agree at the moment AQAP is probably still public enemy number one in that respect, but this is an evolutionary process and everything that happens in Syria I think suggests that it's only a matter of time before what has been a local struggle becomes much more um, regional and certainly much more uh, global. And you see this concern manifested in not just our European allies, but even in the United States of you know nationals from our own countries going there to train and the fear that they will then, now Al-Qaeda will have exactly the capability that Al-Qaeda core will not, will exactly have the capability they haven't had in recent years. That is individuals, in many cases, with clean passports, with battle-hardened experience along the lines, let's say, of what the Lashkari Taiba operatives who took over the, who attacked Mumbai in 2008 had. And you can see a capability that you just pop in the car and drive across Europe and you present yourself, or you're a part of a country with, uh, you have a passport from a country that's part of the visa waiver program and can come to the United States. And this is very important looking in the numbers that our European allies, for instance, have talked about. Those are people they've actually investigated. So that's only a reflection of, I think, a much larger number. Those are the people that they know about. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, just the, the, the part of your question about was it different with the Sinjar records and the Iraq documents, I don't know who advocated for that stuff. I know I advocated during the Bush administration for more transparency on Guantanamo and various issues. And I would say over time the history bears out that in fact more transparency would have been a good thing on all of that for educating the public across the board as opposed to allowing a real debate about who belongs there, who doesn't, and that sort of thing, and informing detention policy, understanding that some, some th secrets had to be withheld, you know, uh, at all times. But, um, you know, just the back on the near army, far army thing, the attacking us was always a step in their plan. It was always part of a process in their plan. It was never the the sole goal. You know, it was never the, the to, it was never the objective. It was always a tactic to get to the objective. You know, and the bottom line is that they see, as David said, they see us as weaker now throughout the region for a variety of reasons, um, and they see that as a, a reason for them to move forward with their their plans. But you know. Um, moving forward, obviously things can change. And, and as Bruce said, um, like his comment was much more a difference in, in emphasis rather than a real difference of opinion. Just yeah. to underscore his view uh, that uh, a lot of their actions are opportunistic. Uh, Ansar Sharia Tunisia um, has a lot of local opportunities, um, or at least if you go back um, a year ago they did. Uh, these days it, the opportunities are a bit less. Uh, but despite the fact that they had so many local opportunities in September 2012, um, if you look at the attack on the U.S. Embassy in Tunis that overran it and almost killed embassy officials. You know, I was there shortly after that happened. Um, September 14th, 2012. Um, you know, local reports indicate that Ansar al-Sharia, I mean, it's, it's indisputable that Ansar al-Sharia rallied people to go there. Uh, local eyewitness accounts have members of, of Ansar al-Sharia Tunisia being instrumental in the decision to charge the embassy. Uh, so that was very opportunistic at the time that the Innocent Muslims of video uh, came out. Um, that was very opportunistic. Um, it wasn't local. It was, it was against the United States. And I think that that illustrates the way that you could have both local opportunity and also be focused on still doing damage to Western interests. Good point. Good point. Uh, Stanley over here. I'm Stan Watson, uh, Department of Justice. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask about something that's been said 
I think by a couple of you, the phrase, uh, something along the lines that Al Qaeda's brand is as strong or as popular as it's ever been uh, in the Middle East, and I, I guess I question that. Um, you know, certainly in the case of Syria, this splintering of Al Qaeda associated groups doesn't make their brand look good, and the fact that they're losing against the Assad regime doesn't make the brand look good. Uh, as you note, uh, the general manager now is in Yemen, and in Yemen, they've just recently had to issue a public apology for an attack they did on a military hospital there. First time I know of it, that Al Qaeda has been in the position of apologizing for something they did. Uh, they claimed they were going to ride to the defense of the Salafis in Damage, and of course the Salafis got their butts kicked and are now being evacuated from Damage in Yemen. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm wondering what successes they're pointing to that would make their brand strong right now. Uh, that certainly, they, you know, right after 9-11, they could point to a spectacular attack on the United States that, that blew everybody away. Now I don't see that, and I don't see how their brand can be nearly as strong as it was then. She said, do you want to start? Sure. Well, I think, well, their brand is certainly spread. There's more groups that, even in Al-Qaeda's decline in recent years, have formally wanted to affiliate themselves with Al-Qaeda, um, when you would think the opposite would be the case, including under al-Zawahiri's rule. Uh, Al-Qaeda has been able to spread its influence to West Africa, to, I think, an unprecedented stent, extent, which I think also speaks to Al-Qaeda's overall strategy. I mean, we know even from the thimble full of documents that was released a few years ago that Bin Laden was talking about Nigeria as being prime or fertile ground to expand the Al-Qaeda brand. And we see that just in the past couple of years, Al-Qaeda has been able to at least influence events in Mali, Mauritania, and Niger, as well as Nigeria. Uh, in, Nigeria. Uh, in my view, actually, Zawahiri's statement the other day exp expelling the ISIS is to me proof of how strong the brand is. That he's taking action against a group that is uh, consequential, that has been popular in some circumstances. But at the same time though, you know, for the past two years we've been hearing about that the most effective of all the insurgent groups in Syria have been, the, have been Jabhat al-Nusra or ISIS. So in that sense I think He's asserting control over it. It shows also that he's not um, irrelevant. I mean, in all these cases, there are going to be setbacks. But I think what's interesting is that in years past, Al Qaeda never cared about the setbacks, or at least in, up until 19, up until 2005, they didn't. In 2005, Zawahiri attempted to discipline Abu Musab al Zarqawi. So the 2005 letter about AQIs. Um, Transgressions again, nothing new. This to me is the same thing playing out in that same tension in that, in that, um, in in that relationship. So I think, you know, it's it's a it's a even in the way that Jabhat al Nusra and ISIS have engaged in much more social welfare activities in Syria than we'd ever seen any of the Al Qaeda affiliates involved, or the Al Qaeda core involved in the past. To me, is a recognition that it has to change and try to maintain the brand. I mean, I, there's going to be setbacks all the time. The fact that they're apologizing and trying to explain those setbacks is also, I think, significant in that for its survival, they're accepting now they have to become a much more politically savvy organization and have to cater to local needs and opinions much more than they ever did in the past. And that's probably ignored all that before. They're much more sensitive now, which worries me much more. You know, I would just actually add historically, and I think David may, may mention this, is also uh, when you think about the GIA uh, in Algeria, they had been involved in, in sort of mass atrocities there. And you, I mean, back in 1998, I believe it was, when bin Laden came in and basically dismantled that organization, created a new one, the GSPC, which was the precursor to uh, Al Qaeda of the Islamic Maghreb. So this is, I think, something that's been gone on, going on for quite some time. Uh, Tom? I just quickly on the brand issue. See, the, the issue here, and this is what's fascinating about Al-Qaeda, is it's, it isn't one brand, right? It's the ideology underlies numerous brands, and because they're very effective at using different branding to get their ideology, push their ideology and their agenda forward. Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria was deliberately not branded as Al-Qaeda in Syria. It was the branded Jabhat al-Nusra. It was supposed to be the local brand in Syria face on the face. I said at the outset that Ayman al-Zawahiri's number one guy in Syria is an Aurora Sham, right? Locally branded. He's not in 
He doesn't call himself, you know, he's not raising a flag saying, I'm Al Qaeda, right? He's in Ar al Sham. You look to Yemen, where they implemented Ansar al Sharia. That has gained them more support. They've had setbacks with that raid on the hospital and some other instances as well. But they're very cognizant of that they're trying to build popular support by using alternative brands like Ansar al Sharia and those types of things. And they do have. They have setbacks, but they also have quite a bit of success, and I think the successes at this point outweigh the failures. Um, but they've done that elsewhere. You know, it's a very clever strategy on their part, and it's part of the confusion we have in the West in understanding what they're doing. Where if a, if a group doesn't come right out and say I'm Al Qaeda in Syria, then they're not Al Qaeda. In, in sort of, if I can follow, sure. But isn't that a very that itself a very indication that the brand is not working for them if they're coming up with these different? No, because it predates 9/11. They were doing this before 9/11. They were doing this before 9/11. I mean, no. I mean, the whole point—the point is not the whole point is not that the brand isn't working. The whole point is that they want the ideology to move forward, and there are different ways to market the ideology. It's like walking into a store filled with Coke products, and you may have different products, but they're all sold by Coca-Cola. You know, basically, they want to, they want to push their sales forward in that way. And the whole point is that you can have you can have alternative brands, you know, drawing from the same ideology and move your goals forward. And that's what they've recognized a long time ago. You know, it's not about it's not about saying, uh, you know, Al Qaeda won. It's about their ideology winning. You know, and I'll, I'll give you a great example: 1998 embassy bombings, U.S. in Tanzania, Tanzania and Kenya. Al Qaeda did not come out and outright claim those attacks. They didn't say Al Qaeda did this. In fact, there was an article all the way into 1999 in New York Times saying we don't know if Bin Laden and Al Qaeda did this. They actually had an alternative name for it that they claimed it under. You know, so they've been playing these games for a long time. You know, it, they they want to be the vanguard of this ideology, which they are. I'll, I'll just very quickly. I think uh, I'm the most in line with you on this panel. I, I do see Al Qaeda itself uh, as being a very tarnished brand. But I think if you define it more broadly the way Tom does, um, it becomes a, a very different picture. That the brand of Salafi jihadism is not as damaged, and the groups, the new Salafi jihadist groups that we see that have a different brand, we're starting to see that they have more organizational links to Al Qaeda. So I think that, that AQ is a tarnished brand. I think that this, the larger perception of brand that Tom outlines is where uh, the notion that the brand is strong, in my view, does become accurate. All right, we're going to we're going to try to to speed up real quick. We've got one question here, then we'll get to Cliff I and Jim. One, oh, that sure. On, on that point, part of the difficulty, see if you think I'm wrong, is the is that we're borrowing the business concept and importing it into, into this realm of analysis, and sometimes it, it cuts both ways. So, for example. When Toyota creates Lexus or Acura, or Honda creates Acura, one can say that suggests that the consumers won't believe that a luxury car with a Honda label or the Toyota label uh, is, is credible, and therefore that shows weakness. On the other hand, if people do buy a Lexus and buy Acura, which made by the same two companies, at that point now they're saying, ah, okay, and then they're strengthened by it. In other words, the the, the dis uh, the diversity of brands can be a way of recognizing a weakness and correcting for it. And you don't necessarily know until you see the sales figures whether it's been successful. Right, right. <laughs> All right, so now we've got, uh, we've got Coca-Cola, yeah, we've cool. got Kobe Bryant, we've got cars. Uh, <laughs> let's see how many more we can, uh, we can add into the mix here. Yes, sir. All right, uh, thank you. Sam Green from the NISA Center at National Defense University. Uh, no Kobe Bryant reference. Uh, I'd like to thank the panel for uh, challenging the conventional wisdom that's always helpful, especially when there's evidence involved. Um, my question has to do with threat assessment. Um, you, what are the consequences for a threat assessment going forward uh, if the panel is correct, particularly in your diffuse centralization argument? And also in the spirit of humility, what are the consequences for a threat assessment going forward if the panel is not correct? Thank you. Don't all rush to the microphone. <laughs> That's a broad question. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the main threat assessment today is that Al Qaeda is a diminishing threat that's basically a counter terrorist threat that can be dealt with by special forces operation or perhaps some offshore uh, positioning. Um, and it means that it's, it's a much more tactical challenge than a strategic one. I mean, I would argue, I think that would be the sense of the panel, but I don't want to be presumptuous, but I would argue that what we've been saying is that the threat is much more systemic and more strategic, that these aren't isolated phenomena that are occurring completely independently of one another, although there is a lot of independence, but nonetheless, Al-Qaeda has a vision and is struggling to, to impose that vision, and therefore, if it's strategic, it means you have to have a much more strategic approach approach the problem. You can't look at them as isolated local phenomena, but part of a much broader conspiracy. And 
dare I use the word that's become singularly unpopular in Washington t today, but you're talking about counterinsurgency, not just being content with counterterrorism. You're talking about viewing it, which I've argued since 2005, David Kilcullen, I think Tom has, and many others, that you know we have to view this much more as a global <laughs> counterinsurgency. Um, that's not just kinetic, which is what counterterrorism is. Counterterrorism, I think, is holding the threat at bay is the Israeli version of mowing the grass, whereas counterinsurgency to me is more reconfiguring or reshaping an environment, working very closely with host, with host countries to not only kinetically you know, decapitate organizations, but to prevent and to stem their efforts to establish a foundation in those countries. Anyone else want to weigh in? Uh, yeah, I mean, to, to uh, quickly weigh in on the, on the second question, uh, what if we're wrong? Um, I think here you're getting into a question of uh, under-aggregation and over-aggregation. Um, I would argue that, that when it comes to um, uh, Al-Qaeda, the uh, current tendency is to under-aggregate, that there are connections in places where people swear that, that what we're seeing is purely local. The risk that uh, my view has is the risk of over-aggregation, that we tend to see um, Al-Qaeda in more places than it actually is. And the risk that that bears, if I am wrong, um, is that you would overlook thing, you might overlook things uh, that are localized threats because you're looking at this from the lens of AQ as being most important. That being said, I don't think anyone on this panel uh, would uh, say that there aren't local jihadist groups. It's obvious that they are. Um, so it, the, the notion that you know, one side of this debate uh, simply ignores local threats, I think, is inaccurate. But I think that, that um, the, the question is a very fair one of you know, what is at stake if you're wrong? And I think that it is under versus over, over aggregation. I have a feeling you're going to talk about Ansar al-Sharia. No, no, I'm just going to use the key word used was evidence, which in our field is sort of, it's sort of an odd thing where I, I can't tell you how many pieces I read on a weekly basis where yes. a theory is put forward with absolutely zero evidence in it. You know, I mean, I, I see this all the time. You know, there's all these models out there for what's going on, and there's not a single anything cited empirically in it, you know, and, and so my definition of all this and my argument on all this, it should be driven by whatever the evidence says, you know, and we should understand what, where the evidence goes and where it doesn't go, and that will help you understand it, and that, you know, part of the reason why this gets so sticky and part of the reason why this became so vehement, as David outlined, is because I think, you know, I think that people do have policy ideas about what should go on in the world, and part of this is that, you know, there's a lot of people who don't want to be fighting a war anymore, and so let's, you know, define Al-Qaeda down to the point where there's nobody left to fight. You know, and what I think that there's a big risk in that. You know, and I think that doesn't mean I want to call for war everywhere. I think Al Qaeda is. I don't think American troops should be sent everywhere from West Africa all the way through. You know, you know northern Pakistan. I mean, you know, holy cow. Uh, but uh, you know, but the bottom line is we should at least we should at least understand we should at least understand what's going on. You know, and um, you know, since 2009, what I would say is. Um, our model, in terms of the threat streams, I think, is the more accurate one. And just look at the very quickly. Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula in December 2009 tries to attack the American homeland, right? That's a new precedent, right? In 2010, you have more plots from Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and you have the Pakistani Taliban in May 2010 dispatch a bomber to Times Square, right? And the U.S. government, State Department, everything will tell you there's a symbiotic relationship, and there absolutely is, between the Pakistani Taliban and Al Qaeda, right? You go forward on, on this, and you see threat streams. There was a plot. A nascent plot, we'll call it, that was actually uh, influenced or guided, according to the Canadian Mounties, by Al Qaeda inside Iran, and don't, that's a whole other panel to discuss that relationship because that's one of the most bizarre things you'll ever see in your life. Um, but you know, so you, so so you ha you have that plot. So you you have these things, you know, you have these threats across the network multiplying from different actors, you know. And one of the things we've even seen is that, um, according to some intel officials and Mike Rogers on the House Intel Committee, you know. Actors, Al Qaeda actors under the command of Gen Al Qaeda's general command in Syria, have been told not to attack us at this point in the West. Hold off. You know, there's actually been an order sent down to say, no reason to right now, right? So the bottom line is that I think these threats empirically are multiplying. You know, how you handle them is is plenty of room for debate, and I don't know the answers to that. I'll tell you, I don't know the answers to that. But you should at least understand the actual evidence, which says that the threats to us are actually multiplying across the network. Okay, we're going to take one more question here from Jim. 
Uh, Jim Phillips from the Heritage Foundation. I'd be interested in the assessment of the panel members on the very complicated, murky relationship between Al Qaeda and Iran. Uh, one of the uh, overlooked recommendations of the 9 11 Commission was that uh, there should be a further investigation of, right. of the nature of this relationship given the. Uh, page 241. I've read it many times. <laughs> page 248, 241. Yep. Chapter and verse here. Yeah, page 128, 60 61 as well. Yeah. And, and not only just turning a blind eye to the movement of Al-Qaeda members, but since then, uh, this very strange uh, supposed form of house arrest in which Al-Qaeda leaders appear to be free to order attacks in Saudi Arabia in May 2003. Three, right. Uh, there's been suggestions that some of the tension between Al-Qaeda core and Al-Qaeda in Iraq or ISIS or, did, or because of ISIS just continues to target the Iranian pilgrims in Iraq and perhaps uh, some of bin Laden's family members in Iran uh, might suffer for those attacks, but how, and, and now there's reports uh, more recently of release of bin Laden family members. So I'm just interested in, in right, how yeah. uh, various members. Would I'm going to try and give you a real quick rundown of this. And I'm, I, now this is yet more. Uh, you've just given John here more impetus to kick my butt to get me to write my monograph on Iran Al Qaeda. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. you know. Thank you very so much. Thank you because you know I, I I've basically been slacking on that. But uh, you know this is this is one of those instances where the evidence should drive your understanding and relationship. Right, and what's interesting about it is that going back to the early 1990s, you see over and over and over and over again instances of collusion between the two. You know, a lot of evidence, right? Kind of interesting. Now you also find, pure, you know, epi episodes of antagonism or tension between the two. You know, the arrest and that sort of thing, and Bin Laden wasn't happy that they weren't releasing certain Al-Qaeda operatives from custody, that sort of thing. And the reason is because I think you're dealing with, you know, Al-Qaeda doesn't want to be owned by any state actor, right? There are parts of Al-Qaeda that are vehemently anti-Shia and don't want cooperation with Iran. Um, but there are also parts at the very senior leadership of, of Al-Qaeda that's pragmatic in this regard and finds that there's actually reasons to cooperate with the Iranians. And the most recent example of this, which is really interesting, is that a guy named, known as uh, Yassin al-Suri has been released from detention. He was placed in arrest the U.S. government, the Obama administration, in July of 2011 and then December of 2011, exposed this network, both through the state and treasury departments, and said that Yassin al-Suri uh, was the head of the Al-Qaeda network in Iran. They placed a $10 million bounty on his head, which made him one of the, effectively one of the most wanted terrorists on the planet. Um, just recently, Yassin al-Suri was actually, we now know, released from custody. The treasury and state department officials went to Al Jazeera and said this, and then I re-reported it, and then gave backstory on what was actually going on. Um, now, this is absolutely fascinating because here's what they said about Yassin al-Suri and what he's doing in Iran. He's facilitating the al-Nusra Front and al-Qaeda's operations in Syria. Well, now, why the heck would the Iranians want him to do that, if you know the picture inside Syria? But the point is there, to go back to the point that David, I think, is very is great on and talking about this, uh, how we don't know, well, you know, there's a large part we don't know. You know, there's part here in their calculation on this stuff that we don't know, right? Again, I think the Bin Laden documents, a full exploitation of those would probably solve a lot of these issues, may even answer the questions on page 240 to 241 of the 9 Commission, right? But all I can say is that there are an awful lot of examples of collusion between the two going back through time. Uh, of course, that would uh, obviously complicate what's going on with the uh, Joint Plan of Action in Geneva. Uh, so right. maybe now's not the right time to release those documents. Right. Um, uh, I should also just, by the way, add that if anyone is interested in looking further at this phenomenon of al-Qaeda and, and Iran, just look at some of the, the designations put forth by my old shop at the Treasury Department. There's been one designation after another revealing al-Qaeda members who've been active inside yeah, Iran. I'll give it to you. Okay, here, State Department, Treasury Department, right? July 27th, 2011, December 28th, 2011, February, I think it's 12th of 2012, October of 2012. Uh, you can go back through the Treasury Department, State Department, uh, you know, designations and official state statements on each of those dates and then even the country reports on terrorism last year that came out, uh, I believe it was April of last year. The State Department, Treasury Department, interestingly enough, since 2011, they're following the evidence, have documented this over and over again. You know, and it's very interesting, this is, keeps going even despite the huge strategic differences between them in Syria and elsewhere. Okay, we're going to wrap up here. I, if anybody would like to uh, just wrap up, if there's anything that you'd like to say in closing, this is your opportunity. You get a minute to sort of summarize or put in a last word of anything that you might have missed. Anyone? Um, report that more Bin Laden documents should be released to the public. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think we got that. All right. Well, I want to thank uh, I want to thank our varsity panel. Uh, this was absolutely not JV. A very uh, uh, edifying event.
Uh, I want to thank you, Bruce, for joining us today as a, as a special guest here. And uh, yeah, thank you, Bruce. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. And uh, just a, a note to you all that uh, FTD will continue to help shape our understanding uh, of Al-Qaeda here in this country. The work of Tom Jocelyn, uh, of David Gardenstein Ross, of Bill Raju, the Long War Journal. I encourage you all to read our work. And I thank you very much and hope to see you at future events. Thank you. <laughs>